before you had a chance. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose um, first, if um, you would mind sort of saying your name and why you're here and this sentence of the, the prison. Well, I'm here. My name is Mitchell Willoughby. I'm here under the sentence of death for three murders. And um, you don't want no more than that. <laughs> and I, I suppose, firstly, um, could we talk about like your um, how maybe you first came to religion, or like what faith you are now? Or do you have a well? Right now, I practice under the Quantum School of Zen, which is a Korean form of a Zen practice, Buddhism. And uh, how I come about that was basically all my life I've been pulled toward the Eastern religions, you know, such as uh, Japan and Chinese and Korean. And uh, then after clearing up from all the drugs and you know, alcohol, all that dependency and everything, I realized that there was more than what I now had. And so I started searching for the inner peace that I needed. And like, I still don't have it, but I'm still searching when I'm a lot closer than I have been. And I suppose um, in the prison itself, is there anyone else that practices the same? belief as you, specific belief as you are? Um, yeah. On death row there's not, uh, people use different things to, you know, get get by, you might say, because of, um, they, they, you know, different religions and things. And um, As far as I know, I'm basically the only true Buddhist on death row. And, uh, as you see from the number of people that show up, there's not that many people interested in it. Because one is that they really don't understand it and, and they're kind of ignorant to it out of, you know, just not being exposed to it. And uh, what initially, like, uh, kind of drew me to it was in karate classes to work we had to meditate and then that taught you to deal with pain and then that, you know, eventually draws you closer and closer to want to learn more and more. So that was um, that was before you were in yes. prison. Yes. Okay. And and how long have you been in prison now? Like that? I have been here fifteen years, going on sixteen years. And so you found Buddhism once you were in, like you sort of became more devoted once you. Were... I kept yeah. I I became more devoted, and I kept building on what I had already learned prior to prison. And how did you find, was, was it hard once you were in prison to get access to materials, or how did you find? Well, basically I got the materials from just, um, started writing uh, uh, different publications to get more information on it, and uh, to have books, you know, uh, to purchase books. And then um, I was, uh, uh, my now, teacher, uh, Quang Mayon, which is now in Australia, actually, at the at a Zen center down there, um, through uh, the Clay City Quantum School of Zen, is actually where I got a hold of uh, her. She's also a Buddhist nun, and so she has been kind of uh, guiding me, and we correspond, and she gives me the different meditations and the proper mindfulness and things that, you know, on the path. And I suppose, um, could you describe what um, the main things that you find benefit you from your, um, your path? Um, the number one thing is I used to be real hot-tempered, you know, real 
you know, angry, you might say, from within. And there is no anger no longer. There is, uh, of course, they say prison, you know, death rows for killing us and not rehabilitation. But I don't believe that because of uh, each person has an obligation to himself and his fellow people to better their self in order to not no longer harm others. And that's a basic Buddhist teaching also. And so the, that, I suppose that follows it then. It had, um, has it been still hard to come to grips? Like I suppose you believe in reincarnation then like how does that sort of change your opinion to being on death row than say maybe other prisoners? Is it sort mm. of a... Well, it's, I look at it like you're terminally ill. You know you're going to die, but you're not sure when. All of us are terminally ill. And so you try to live each day to the best that you can and, and just try to do the best you can with what you got. And I suppose, like, being the um, only sort of practicing Buddhist on death road, you've, is there, like, maybe any, um, you're saying there's ignorance, is there any hostility or, like, prejudice? No. No, they're, they're, most people are rather curious and they will ask questions and they will ask to borrow books and um, they'll talk to you and one of the main things I usually tell people like when they ask me, I said, let your thoughts be your actions. Like, you know, some people, you have a choice on death row, you can, or terminally ill people, you can lay down and mope about it and whine and go on or you can actually try to do something with it and make something of it. You can look at it as something positive to go on and then when death comes you face it and deal with that. And do you find that um, with your practice that attitude is getting easier? I mean it's becoming sort of easier, you're more at peace? Yes, yes. There's, there's, it takes out the aggression. What it does, it makes you understand where your anger come from. Where the anger is, you, you learn to do away with the anger and replace it with positive thought. Like if someone, say like, if someone gets mad at you, then you understand why that person is angry. He's sometimes not angry at you yourself. He's angry within himself with his present position or something happened to him and he's just taking it out, you know, or verbally expressing it towards you. And once you understand that, then you have compassion for that person because they really don't understand why they're being angry. Mm -hmm. And did you, were you of like a different faith before? Wasn't we raised? Well, I was raised uh, a Baptist, actually, and within that religion, it's hell and fire and brimstone, you know, be saved and uh, go to heaven no matter what you do, you can be saved. And I, even when I was very young, I knew that there had to be more to a, a religion than just saying, okay, I'm saved and then try to do good all the time, and it just doesn't work like that. Mm. And did you um, find your, your family, I mean, were you becoming sort of more leaning towards Buddhism? Sorry, excuse me. Um, leaning um, more towards um, Buddhism, did you, like, how did your family sort of react or did they, did, you, did they react or did you tell them about it or? About yeah, I'm, I am very close with um, my family and uh, like my mom, dad, and all my other kinfolk and stuff. And they just, they really didn't express anything. It's just like, uh, okay, that's what he's doing. That's what he does. <laughs> We're real close and there's no animosity or anything like that. It's just accepted and you go on. Excellent. Right, and so I suppose um, within the Um, yeah, in terms of um, Rabina, particularly, like, even even though it's a, a different um, sort of stream of Buddhism, um, maybe what is it with, I mean, what do you get from Rabina's teachings? 
Well, the teachings, uh, Rabina's teachings are basically the same. It's just different part of the world where they come from. They're, um, the meditations, they're so similar that you really couldn't say one was better than the other. Not, it, ain't, it ain't about that. It's about just listening to have the support or, or trying to learn things that you don't already know and and to get insight from a practicing nun, Buddhist nun, and uh, because she apparently, you know, she has way more experience at this than I do. And even though I've learned a lot for the last, let's see, I've been at this steady for about 13 years, and I still learn from listening to others, whether it's uh, uh, Buddhist tapes or reading or but the teachings are basically the same excellent and um okay yeah that, that, that's great i think that's that's it yeah thanks you're here yeah, yeah. well my name is leaf halverson uh 1983 i was uh I committed a triple murder with another man that resulted uh, in three people dying and was sentenced to death for two of the murders and then a life sentence on one. Uh, I've been in prison for 15 years. Uh, I lived a fairly stable life for 28 years. Uh, I got caught up into cocaine and several other mind-altering substances. Um, from about 81 to 82, Notwithstanding recreational drug use that I had over the years, but, uh, it, it culminated into uh, psychosis and three people died. And I suppose, did, um, were you at that time religious in it? I mean, in yes, I, I, I was raised Catholic uh, since I was a child, uh, attended Catholic school. Mm -hmm. um, Continued on in that same vein of, of uh, spirituality. Uh, continue to practice it to this day, uh, and it, it's changed to some degree. I mean, it's uh, as everything, uh, but I continue to be a practicing Catholic. And so, was there like a, when you were first um, put into prison? Was there like a lapse, or did you sort of continue on or keep it, keep your the faith, or was it? Mm -mm. Well, I will say this, up until the time that I was arrested, my religion was basically um, a weekly thing or a, a bi-weekly thing. It wasn't stringent. Uh, it, w once I was sentenced to death, there was more reflection on my own uh, mortality. There's more reflection on, on myself and my life. And, and of course, prison kind of does that. It, there's, there's an aspect that's... Um, kind of contemporary, uh, more reflection. And so, yeah, I think that I basically started looking at myself more and looking at something outside of me and my, and my relationship with that. Um, uh, also, also I, I hold a lot of um, contrition in my heart for, for what happened. Um, wish I could make reformation, but how do you do that? You, you don't know how. Uh, I mean, it's almost impossible. I, I do small things. I, I try to work with children some and, and things like that uh, that's been in trouble and, and on drugs. But, I mean, there's just so much you can do. You can't bring three people back, you know. But do you find with your practice it's getting easier made to, like, to come to terms with or, I mean, maybe your own mortality or like in terms of... No, I, 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 it, it's probably one of the biggest... <laughs> peaceful things in my life. It's the most peaceful aspect of my life. Um, it's, it's, it's something that has allowed me to grow, know myself more, uh, become who I am today, which is totally different than it was 15 years ago. Uh, so I can say that probably the biggest motivation is one is the peace of mind, the tranquility that I get from from my, from my religion. Uh, but it's also the, the process of getting to know myself and, and to make changes uh, which, which have come about through different, different means, whether it be from reading, from 
spiritual exercises or whatever. I, I suppose within the the, uh, the death row community, or like the, mm -hmm. are there are other um, practicing Catholics, or is yeah, it, mm -hmm. there's about. I think there's probably seven of us right now. Uh, there's been more, and some of the guys have gotten off death row. Uh, my best friend was recently executed in July in Harold. He was uh, a man who, who I brought into the church, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago. Um, and he died a practicing Catholic, and it, it meant much much to him uh, as he met his death uh, well, almost a year ago. Um, and it was fairly well. There, there was a lot of publicity about him, uh, about Harold and stuff like that, uh, which and you can read in, in in his demeanor in his life. I mean, he walked in and went to his death. I mean, he he, he let go, you know, and, and he went on. Uh, no fight, no fuss, uh, and I think a lot of that had to do with his faith. Uh, And are there, are there other prisoners now that um, you might have that that same sense, or is there is there like a fault? Well, I, I don't know. I think that's with it, it, so. prison in some ways is a is a microcosm of of society in some ways. I mean, there's there's similarities, and everybody's on different levels and different understandings and reasons, motivations. Um, so I don't know. I mean. W I, I can't say that I, I believe I, I believe in my faith because I'm going to die. I don't believe that I, I, about myself. Others may. Um, I think that how I die and what happens to me be a product, product of how I lived, uh, even though there's been heinous things that have happened in my past. Um, but I don't know. It's it's just a part of my life now. And it, I mean, how I could go out here today and get stabbed and die. So, I mean, it's, it's really kind of fruitless to, to to continually think about your death, even though at times it does come up uh, in, in our sentences here. Um, but guys, on you know, uh, there is there is no Muslims, as far as I know, on death row. Uh, there's Catholics and a variety of different Protestant beliefs, and then there's some who don't adhere to to it or at least if they do they're private about it um, and are there any maybe um prejudices or like hostilities towards different oh i think things? there is i think uh, just as there is in society there's spiritual bigotry which is really a shame i mean I, I, I find that that's probably one of the biggest drawbacks of christianity and and probably even of islam and other other religions that there is this bigotry instead of trying to find common ground. Uh, there are some movements in society, but um, in, the, in, in the South United States, you're more inclined to the uh, hell and brimstone type of thing, um, which would probably adhere more to a bigotry of, of, of spiritualness, that they are right, you're wrong, and, they, and, and you, don't, you have this linear type thinking instead of... Uh, something that encompasses everything. I mean, it's a it's a little bit more different than I'm in. You know, I, I was brought up in the Catholic Church, which uh, they're more empathetic, in my opinion, to others and their beliefs. Uh, and then I suppose, then how does that apply to your attitude toward Buddhism? Like how? Buddhism is something that I accept. Uh, in fact. The guy that I'm on death row with is a Buddhist. Uh, you talk to him, Mitchell, and uh, you know that that's his chosen path of, of spiritual enlightenment. Who am I to say uh, <laughs> that that's the wrong way? I don't. I I can't say that for him, and I won't say it for anybody. Even the guy who's a Baptist, that's his way of, of communing with his God. Um, so I'm okay with it. Um, it's interesting to me. I read all kinds of books. Uh, I'm very interested in my own people's heritage as far as their their pagan beliefs. I, I read a lot about uh, German society, that kind of type of thing, um, uh, which has become 
more elevated to the social consciousness and people are more aware of it now. I think it's become something that people talk about. But I've, I've studied that for years, I mean years before people even talked about it normally openly. But I mean it's all interesting to me because this is how people drew some kind of spirit or power from, from something that was above them or, or, or you know some transcendental power. And I don't know. Who am I to say <laughs> which way you go with that? I, I'm just not the one to say it, mm. nor would I. Uh, I do have opinions, <laughs> but I mean, they're my opinions, and and I wouldn't impose them on you. I'd hope that you'd listen to mine, and I'd listen to yours. And that's that's basically how I look at, at, at Buddhism, and and I think we learn from each other. I mean, I come. This is I don't know third time I've come to listen to Rabina, and I knew a few Buddhists on the street, and, and I always learn something from the, the there's there's something that is common to all of us uh, whether we express it in different ways or, or or show it in different ways I think that's true but, and do you think the same way that Buddhism says you know you can visualize Jesus Christ in your meditation is there that same maybe space for you and your Catholic beliefs to kind of well sure I mean yeah, uh, you know, just because Buddhism says I can do this doesn't mean I can or I can. You know, mm -hmm. I did it long before, for a new Buddhist said you could do it. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's um, it doesn't make me feel like oh they're trying to suck me in because they are, in my opinion, they are not that type of person. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of goes along with my own. Uh, if if you said hey I'd like to go to a Catholic mass, I'd say well sure you know come on. And then if you asked me, as Harold did, I mean, Harold came to me and asked me if I would teach him the teachings of the church, which I did. I, we, we used to sit down and, and I basically sponsored him or, or brought him into it. And from there, I mean, once you're once in the Catholic tradition, once you're there and you become, then you, then you it's upon yourself to learn and start, uh, as with anything. And then, of course, you're there to hear and share and... and, and give back and forth with each other, which I do with Rabina here, and, you know, that's, that's important, and we've become a multicultural society, we're, we're no longer fixed in these little clans here and there on the earth, we're, we're, we're global, and, and of course, I mean, in, the, in my situation, as far as uh, being, going to be probably executed by the state of Kentucky, uh, the United States has become really are, are starting to be focused on by other countries uh, in, the, in the world uh, as far as what their human rights record is. and uh, It's nothing to be proud of, in my opinion. Um, and, and I have a lot of trouble now. I do have a lot of trouble with people who support the death penalty uh, because they say, I'm a Christian and I believe that's the right thing to do. Well, they're taking a little liberty there, I think, with any type of, uh, with life. You know, no doubt people deserve punishment, whether you have a right to take somebody's life, unless they've ever done that and know what the, what the burden is of that. I don't think that they'd really want to do it. So, but, you know, people use religion sometimes wrongly by ra using it to rationalize even acts that are supposedly sanctioned by governments. And there's something wrong with that, in my opinion. Um, and of course, Buddhist philosophy uh, doesn't believe in that. I mean, they didn't. I'm sure they've had their wars, and, and I'm sure that they've had needs to do it. But their basically their philosophy is that you don't kill, uh, you show compassion, and probably compassion is one of the worst punishments that a man could have. Uh, I mean, that's it, it actually. If the victims in my crime had come to me and they wrapped their arms around me, it would tear my heart out because that would show my compassion. And I know that there's something being ta there had been something taken from them that is far beyond precious you know, that, that can never be returned to those people. So, uh, in in that concept, I think that's a good concept, and I think it's it's. The way the world should be, and probably less people would would use violence to, to solve their problems. I mean, that, what, what's our government showing you? This is how you solve a problem: you eradicate, 
well, that's a little ridiculous when you tell the kid, don't. <laughs> don't be out here shooting each other, but yet the government can do it. So I don't know. There's drawbacks in every religion, I guess, but I mean, we're human. We have faults. Um, Excellent. Good enough? Yeah, yeah. You just started off with um, Mitch. Firstly, if you just like say your name and if you want to like why you're here. And, okay. Yeah. I'm Ralph Bays. Uh, I'm here just, I've had some problems lately in uh, my prayer life. Uh, as I pray, I find that I'm being bombarded with thoughts uh, that are not pertaining to what I'm wanting to pray about and they're very distracting and the meditation course I thought would uh, help with uh, training my mind to be able to stay in that one area that I wanted as I'm praying and so you're uh, what faith are you? Uh, non-denominational Christian uh, closer to a Pentecostal than anything I guess uh, what I find is very enlightening. Uh, I think a, uh, a major part of what's going on in the discussion, because she's talking a lot about the, the, the way Buddha, Buddhism sees things, that you have to uh, take some of that and relate that to your own faith. Uh, but a big thing is not to shut your mind to it. You know, so many factions of the Christian religion are so afraid of what they may learn from some other place. The whole fact is, as a Christian, we're supposed to be looking for truth. And if we're searching for truth, what does it matter where it comes from? And we can use that truth and walk further in our spiritual lives and our physical. Definitely, yeah. So, were you raised... Um uh, <laughs> I actually didn't start going to church until I was about 16 when I was in the army. Uh, I had, uh, I think, second night basic training, maybe the first night, can't remember anymore. There was a, I was just 16, had a, a whole group of new guys that were bunking down with in open barracks. There were about 50 or 60 guys in this barracks, and one of them was kneeling alongside his bunk praying. And a couple of the guys were harassing him about it. And it just kind of ticked me off that anybody would, would mess with anybody over something like that. And they, I uh, made my uh, opinion known. <laughs> and it didn't quit. As I, so I went down and proceeded to drag a couple of these guys out of their bunks and beat them senseless. And... Uh, a few seconds after I got into this, I felt a hand touch my shoulder, and I turned around to hit whoever it was. It turned out to be the guy that had been praying. He told me this wasn't the way. And we sat down and we talked about what had been going on in my life up to that point, and, and uh, for several hours. Later on that night, by myself, I asked Christ into my life. And uh, on and off, Mostly on, I have uh, tried to follow the teachings of Christ. Uh, it's not always easy. A lot of times it's just plain stubbornness on our part that uh, we're going to do it our way. God, I can do this better. Give it back to me. <laughs> and uh, so it's part of what's gotten me in this trouble. Instead of me trusting God for my protection, I went out and bought a gun and and uh, in the end result, they ended up killing two police officers who were trying to kill me. Uh, that's why I'm here. And so how, how long have you been in, the, in this particular? Uh, a shooting incident happened, what, in 1992, January. I can't even give you the exact date. I don't pay much attention to it. That's what upsets my attorneys quite a bit because I just tell them, look, this is your job to do this. I will cooperate where I can, but I'm not going to worry about it. If they execute me, that's just better off for me because I'm going home, and if not, I'm going to do the work of Christ while I'm here on earth. So <laughs> you lose the fear. You know, uh, the shooting incident that I was involved in was I was extremely upset. 
with some things that had been going on uh, in her family problems uh, that kept getting the law drug into us on stuff that wasn't true. And, and uh, by the time these police, well, this one individual come up, he made it clear that he was playing games with part of the problem side of the family and, and uh, I wasn't going to put up with it. And, he was going to arrest me on some old junk charges that I knew better, didn't, supposedly didn't even exist anymore. I asked him to see a warrant. He didn't have one. I told him when he got one to come back. As a result, he got upset, called in a few lies, and come back with a sheriff. And the minute they seen me, I, I come out unarmed to go ahead and go in with him. Was, you know, it just got nutty. He seen me and started shooting. And, uh, well, actually, both of them started shooting. Uh, but I got back to my rifle and we went to war. Uh, about 30 seconds, we exchanged a little over 70 rounds between the three of us. And two men died out of that. It took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that I'd taken human life. Uh, I've grown up in a hunting and fishing family. And so hunting. You know, taking quote life of animals was never a problem with me, but uh, the taking a human life was something very sacred, and it wasn't my place to do. Uh, it, uh, I still deal with it. I cry quite often at night over the problems that I put the men's family through, and my own. It's uh, this is I find my peace in in prayer and in in believing in an afterlife. Uh, that isn't going to have all these problems. And do you find um, also solace in other prisoners sharing those beliefs, or is it a personal? It's both. Uh, when you find something good, you like to share it. Uh, or at least I do. I think most people do. Uh, and for me, the uh, the things that I've learned through my studies in the Bible. Uh, my prayer life has brought me a lot of joy and contentment and peace. Uh, it's allowed me to uh, walk through some very tough times. And uh, when I see someone hurting or, or walking around in confusion and, and uh, frustration, I want to reach out and help where I can. And for me, that's how I do it. I, I show them the Word of God and the Bible. and. Uh, we sat down, talk, and just some everyday stuff. Not all necessary. I'm a, I couldn't quote scripture, chapter and verse if I had to. I don't think, but the basics are there, and and uh, I think that's what's important. Where your heart is. And you were talking about that incident in the barracks. Do you find in like in prison, there's the same kind of maybe um. Like hostility towards people following. There is, but it's, uh, in this case, it was kids, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds that, that uh, just kids can be mean. <laughs> if you're not like them, you're wrong. Uh, in prison, most of the guys here have had the opportunity to uh, uh, grow up some and, and uh, come to some harsh realizations that. You know, this is not the way to act. And uh, in here, for the most part, they're sober and dope-free. Their minds are cleared up enough to where they actually can see what they're doing and, and why they're doing it, if they'll take the time to do so. A lot of things are done out of frustration and anger. If you can uh, alleviate that, you're a long way towards making peace all the way around. And uh, on the SSU, on death row here, it's a, a, a small group, only about 32 people. And we do intermix a little bit with uh, the rest of the prison population, but it's not on a, a all day, every day type thing. So it's more of an extended family. And we understand for the privileges that we're allowed to have here that we have to keep a pretty tight ship going as far as no trouble and no major problems. Um, every now and then you'll see a quick fist fight blow up uh, out there, but not very often even that. And it's never any kind of weapons or anything. So it, uh, 
it moves right along. I suppose um, talking about Buddhism, what um, was it just? Um, yeah, what attract? It was just to quieten your mind that attracted you. Like, what what have mm-hmm. you known about Buddhism? Like, uh, stuff that you hear from from TV and and too often sources have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, uh, truly, I haven't done much reading on the subject. Uh, I never really wanted to uh, get into too much of it. I know Buddhists uh, welcome any religious group into their settings to, to uh, study with, and, and I think they are more intent on helping the world through enlightening men regardless of what they want to call themselves. It's finding that inner peace, finding themselves, finding out how to deal with themselves that, that makes the difference for them. Uh, to that end, that's a good group. Uh, because of my Christian beliefs, I think they're wrong about the reincarnation aspects of the faith. Uh, as far as coming back as different animals and people and, and so forth. My thoughts on the subject are that we are created at birth and from that point on it, it will be an everlasting life. Uh, though the body may decay and die away, the, the spirit and the soul, the energy and the, and the intellect will re- always remain. It, it, and it does, in a sense, reincarnate. It, 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 uh, reincarnate isn't the word I want to use. It changes. It evolves. And uh, in this life, if we choose to follow the teachings of Christ, we're, we'll be allowed to evolve in a state where we can become closer to our Creator, more like Him, and... Uh, if you're not, well, you're going to be destroyed. That part bothers me about seeing a whole lot of people that I think are going to be destroyed. It's hard to tell someone like a Buddhist that is firmly believing in the in their faith, their their that look, you know, this <laughs> you you're a good person, but without Christ, you're going to burn. <laughs> you're going to be destroyed. Uh, and even in the Christian face, it gets changes from one to the other. From uh, Jehovah's Witness, for instance, says that hell or the dis- destruction that the Bible talks about is being separated from God. It's not actually being destroyed. Uh, and the way I read my Bible. No one is actually destroyed, but you're put in everlasting torment if you don't follow the teachings of Christ. So the energy, the spirit, the the spirit, uh, which is your energy and your intellect is going to be forever. In in a lot of ways, the Buddhist uh, beliefs offer some... uh, encouragement to follow their ways <laughs> uh, just simply for the reincarnation aspect of it but uh, I, I think I'm going to stay with my Christian beliefs <laughs> and so I suppose like maybe in the light of like your life then um, that you're at ease with like the like um, your your death and stuff, and you can you've come to oh yeah, that's yeah. not a problem. That's it, it, it irritates my attorneys a lot. <laughs> they don't understand it, uh, but they're again, you know, we we get caught up in so much about what's going on around us. At the time when I shot these two men, it was self defense, but it was still taking of life, and that was not my right according to the word of God. It's not my right. Uh, uh, had I been practicing what I preach and walking in faith that regardless of what came towards me or at me, that God would take care of that. And, 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 and God taking care of that doesn't necessarily mean pie in the sky and everything's fine all the time. We uh, go through trials. Uh, we suffer. 
and through that suffering oftentimes are made stronger for the suffering. Uh, we have to learn to be able to deal with that. And uh, that's the one thing nobody likes. They don't like pain. They don't like uh, growth is uh, not always the easiest thing to achieve. It, it, it takes commit, committing yourself to a way of life. I suppose um, with Rabina specifically, like if you maybe just, um, even though you, know, you, you don't have Buddhist leanings, or, but like just her, what it is, do you think maybe attracts people or what it is about her, that, or like her style? She's or very real. Impression, yeah. uh, she believes in what she's saying. Uh, she wants to help. Uh, and she's not uh, pushy as far as something I try to tell many of my Christian friends. You cannot shove Bible down a person's throat. They're going to accept it or they're not. But even if they don't fully accept what you say, if they will glean even morsels of what and, and help them become a better person, then you, you're you're advancing. They're they're getting good out of it. Hopefully, in the end, they will see where they that the further they follow those teachings, the better off they are. And when they come to accept Christ, that they'll be uh, endued with more power to live a better life. And uh, through that, eternity. My name's Philip Carlett. And what it is that, um, you, what the situation is here, like you come and meet or what this is? Well, the situation here is primarily that uh, brothers and Christians get together to try to find ourselves and our God, you know, to find out uh, primarily, primarily what religion you want to be, you know what I'm saying? If you want to follow the Lord or if you want to follow Buddhism right, and... Uh, it's a painstaking process, you know what I'm saying? It takes, you know, you got a lot of, a lot of things you've got to go through, you know, humiliation and aggravation and uh, things like that to uh, pretty much keep up with your religion, you know? And uh, it's a tough battle. It's all uphill, you know, and uh, just think it's the good chaplains that, you know, people that don't understand what they're really looking for, they think, you know, you can come down here and talk to the chaplain, you know, and try to work out your problems and see what, you know, what you don't understand, and the chaplain will help you out and you know, try to help you establish to where you want to be in your religious life. And how have you found that's helped you as it, if you come? Well, it's, I found it's helped me a lot because it's took me 33 years to learn that, uh, there is a God, you know, to uh, someone you can turn to that's got higher power than what than what we have to deal with our problems, you know, and uh, help you to understand that you have a better life in this world than what we're leading on our own, you know, that you just can't do it on your own, that you've got to turn to a higher power <clears throat> and uh, be able to understand that, uh, you know, life is just not a, like a bowl of cherries that everybody thinks it is, you know. You've got to journey toward the life that you want, you know, and the way you direct your life depends on how you lead your future. You know, uh, what you say determines your future. Excuse me. What you say and how you act, and you know, all determines on how your future is going to be determined as a Christian brother you know, following your religion. And have you found that as a group it's helped to get stronger, like with more than one of you, it's been a quicker process, or is it an individual? Well, it's not a, really a, any quick process to it. You know, it's a lot of painstaking reading and researching. Uh, and yes, as far as being in a group session with Christ, other Christians, 
You know, it uh, it helps you a lot. It makes you stronger. Plus, if you don't understand something, like the chaplain, you've got others there to help you understand what you're missing, you know, and what you you're what you've not graduated to yet. Okay, and just on like Buddhism, could you just tell us what you know, like what you've heard about Buddhism or what you think it's about, roughly, even if. Uh. Buddhism, I don't really know too much about it because uh, I've been too busy researching, you know, my beliefs and everything. But as far as I know, it's the same as any other religion, you know. You know, you just got to pretty much follow your dreams, you know. Everybody's, well, I look at it, there's only one God, no matter who you're praising. You know what I'm saying? It's all one creator. You know, that created everything, and it don't make no difference if it's a if a man thinks it's a Buddhism God, a Christian God, or some other God. You know what I'm saying? Everybody worships in their own way, but when it comes down to it, they're still all worshiping one God. You know what I'm saying? It's all there's multiple different religions, but it all goes back to one God. You know what I'm saying? The Creator. My name is Ulysses Simpson Grant Davis III. I am the Imam for the Islamic community here at Eddyville, called the Masjid Muhammad. Okay, and um, so you're an uh, inmate in. Yes, I'm. I'm an inmate here. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I study Al Islam. Uh, I practice the faith. And uh, what else can I tell you? Is there any other questions you'd like to know? Well, um, basically, basically um, I was wondering how uh, other like, faiths would relate within the prison. Like, well, it, as you'll notice, uh, the Eddyville here is uh, what we call uh, uh, an interfaith community. And for us to get along together, uh, it's best for us to try to learn and understand one another's religion or one another's beliefs so that we can give one another the kind of respect that we need to give. Of course, you know, with the political climate, uh, things happening in Iraq and al-Islam and the large, we're a small community here, uh, people look at Islam in a different light uh, because either political-wise or misunderstanding, but uh, we practice the faith and the belief of one God. And uh, you'll notice that... Uh, Christianity, as well as Islam, and as well as Jews or Hebrews or whatever, practice a monotheistic religion. And so we all try to key in on that monotheistic aspect in the belief in one God. And hopefully we keep things down to a dull roar. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Who knows? Is there anything else you'd like to know about Islam? Well, I was wondering also, just as you just interviewed Ralph, mm -hmm. a, a Ralph was also a Muslim too, <laughs> at oh. one time. Oh, okay. Yeah, Ralph was also uh, part of our, our our community at one time, and uh, I guess he saw some other enlightenment uh, in Buddhism, and uh, we didn't have any problem, you know, with him being Buddhist slash Muslim, but uh, he felt like that he wanted to spend a larger amount of time in Buddhism, and. Uh, Every man has to search for his own path. And uh, with Al Islam, uh, there is uh, no compulsion. We don't, we don't force anyone to be a Muslim. Uh, you be a Muslim or you become a Muslim because Allah calls you to be a Muslim. And uh, my understanding uh, in Buddhism is, is that uh, you become a Buddhist because you're searching. And whatever you're searching for, uh, you're hoping that you're able to find it. And you're hoping that you're able to find it either in, in Buddhism or Al-Islam. But for some, it's probably Buddhism. And for some, it's probably Al-Islam or whatever religious that they're, they're looking for. Is there any other questions? <laughs> you, you, you sure? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Now. Yeah, first, um, if you... 
you mind just yeah, saying your name and um, like how long you're serving and if you don't mind saying why you're um, an inmate? Oh, my name is William Patman. Uh, I'm doing a 15 year sentence for robbery. Uh, I've been in here approximately uh, 10 years and I possibly serve out next year. I'm looking forward to getting out of prison and doing something constructive with my life. Uh, prison has taught me that uh, one has to be responsible for himself and responsible for his actions. And that uh, in this day and time, a man has to search within himself and find things that will sustain him. Because prison life nowadays is very, very bad. And if you don't have your frame of mind that will sustain you, you will die in prison nowadays. It's that bad. My name is Calvin Smith. I'm 27 years old. Uh, I've been incarcerated for five years, and I have a 10-year sentence. I'm uh, incarcerated for possession of narcotics and burglary, and uh, I'm on parole now, and hopefully I will be back out in society within the next few months. My name is Donnell Flippin. I'm 37 years old and I'm doing a 20 year sentence for first degree manslaughter. During my time of incarceration, I've seen a lot of things and read a numerous of literature and I don't have no certain denom denomination. However, I will say that if a person will respect the, the next man as he would himself, then everything will be all right and we can live in love, peace and happiness. And I wish that everyone would try to acknowledge that that you shouldn't down another person for what they do or what religion they believe in, because, like I said, it's all we all we all are one human race, and in order for us to get along, then we just have to, you know, one thing I can say is we just have to first respect ourselves and then the next man. What another person does is their business, you know, and that's what, that's all I got to say, you know. What you talking about? Oh, just tell them your name and like the um, sentence you're showing and, and um, yeah, and if you don't mind saying why you're um, serving that sentence. Well, my name is Roy Stewart. I committed a crime when I was young and um, I've been paying for it ever since. I don't blame no one but myself and I like the uh, cross sign for what he's, he's talking about and uh, we all can live in harmony, and we are, cause we is a part of the human race, like he was saying. But cause we have different views, we have to learn how to respect that different views and move on to find common ground where we can uh, uh, better understand our difference and move on. Okay, and if anyone would like to sort of say that comments how they view Buddhism or what they think of Rabina's Russian teachers and you know. Oh I like her. Uh, you know, I, I like Rabina because Rabina brings uh, uh, wisdom, understanding to me. And this is the, uh, the second time I uh, encountered her, but she leaves a, 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 a print on me as a person. And um, I learned how to grow more from listening to her and, and other people. See, I tried to, m me being a human being, I'm open for all knowledge. Knowledge is something I hunger for. So when I when she does does come down here to see us, I you know I I, I embrace it because it's food for me, and I that's why I like listening to Bean. I think it's nice when she comes and it gives a lot of inmates spiritual enlightenment. I think she's real enlightened into the world and she's very intelligent. And uh, she's, she's, I know it's her Buddhist religion 
you know, and I think she's she's real enlightened about the world itself and the whole universe. She's got a spiritual awakening, and uh, I'm, I would like to reach that goal just like she has. I can tell by the way she had just talked in her that she's she's spiritually awakened. She really is, and I'm glad that she comes and hope she comes back again soon here at KSP. That's all. Uh, I see Babina as being a woman that uh, has qualities that one should try to emulate. She uh, brought Buddhism here to try to give us an understanding of the complexities of Buddhism and the, the depth of, of its knowledge and wisdom. I found Buddhism to be uh, uh, something that Maybe majority of people don't have the mentality to try to understand the concepts. And I found some of the concepts very challenging. But overall, I will say that uh, Buddhism is probably not for, for everyone. And it, it takes a, a, a specific type of person to, to really get into Buddhism. I don't think I will be able to handle the, the, the stringent life of, of one who lives to, to obtain Buddhism or whatever it is they're searching for, but I do have the utmost respect for Buddhism, and uh, I hope she comes back and keep trying to enlighten us, because we do need that in prison nowadays. Thank you. Uh, me, me personally, um, this is my first time ever socializing with anyone of the Buddhism religion, and it's like he was saying, it's very deep, and I, me personally, I wouldn't mind reading up on uh, the Buddhism uh, faith because, I mean, I have, have no, uh, I'm not Baptist, Christian, and, uh, I'm just searching. And uh, hello, Australia. <laughs> hey, we thank y'all for coming. Hey, You ain't like saying what you explain what you're doing. Oh, right? uh, yeah. I'm just spitting all the birth, all the Mother's Day cards together in the pack, it's, uh, so we so they can be handed out to the pop general population and the uh, guys up in PC, so they can send to their mothers and birthday cards here I got, and so they can get them too, and uh. See, they get uh, three cards a month. To, uh, this has uh, been donated to the institution, the chapel. And uh, we get them, they each inmate get three of them. They will come on down and get them. And uh, Mother's Day is coming up this Sunday, and they've been coming down and picking them up. And uh, we're just trying to get some ready for them. Okay. You have any questions? Yeah, would you, would you mind like, um, maybe yeah, talking a little bit about um, the about religion in the prison? And the religion? Religion. Maybe well, how they get on with each other? Or? Well, um, religion's in the... Mm, that's kind of touchy, but I can explain the best I can to you. The religious uh, guys in this institution... Um, you know they got Muslims, you got uh, Catholics, Christians, you have Jews, you have um, um, so what, what, what's that, um, what's Ms. Tree, what's that tape we showed last night on that TMT? The Astro religion? Yeah, what's they call? It's Astro. They worship Thor, the god of thunder. Yeah, the Astro, the Astro plane religion. They worship Thor. You know, you know uh, the Greek uh, barbarian god. That's who he, he was, Thor. And uh, on the big part, you know, we do get along. You know, we bump heads when it comes to religious. Everybody have their own opinion. And that goes with the Catholics, the Christians, you know, all the other um, sect, you know, everybody just believe, they believe in God, but they believe in their own way. 
uh, who is God and what his God is for and, and you know so myself personally I believe in Jesus Christ and uh, I don't bump heads because I don't even talk about it with people outside of my um, belief of being a Christian that way that's keep arguments down for me you know because people like the special guys in the institution they like to uh, talk about how they God per se is and I don't, my God is, is love you know my God is about love and, and that's all we is about so if you have any questions I'll yeah, did, did you um, did you find um, God more in prison, or were you like the stronger? No, I, I myself, I dealt with a lot of religions, you know, over my over years. You know, I had this not just come to penitentiary and say I'm gonna be, you know, a, a Christian. You know, my family is. Uh, raised me up being a Christian, but when I got old enough, I started, you know, seeing what religion it was right for me. And uh, my, by me was growing up, I went, to, I can say I studied uh, Islam. Um, I studied uh, Catholic. I studied uh, Being a Jew, um, I found after all what I, you know, experienced, Christianity is more for me because, uh, don't get me wrong now, Christianity is a part of being a, a, a Jew because Jesus Christ was a Jew but they did not accept him of being who he was and that's why they didn't didn't know him like a, like I know him me being a Christian I know him and uh they have stay understanding of of God, and I have me being a Christian have my understanding of God and who is God. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> That's me, yes. Even though in this, uh, I now have more hair than I had in this picture, but. Yeah, excellent, thanks. Great. Okay, well, first, if you, I mean, if you want to just, yeah, tell us why you're here in prison and all. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, my name's Ralph Olspowski. Uh I'm currently doing a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years for first-degree murder, first-degree burglary, and first-degree robbery. Okay, and how long have you been? Uh, I've been in this penitentiary three years. I've been locked up a total of five years. Okay, and before you discovered Buddhism, or before you sort of found out about Buddhism, how did you find sort of your prison life, or just in general? Mm. It was, it was, it was, how would, how would, how would you put that? It was, um, very confusing. I wasn't as focused. Uh, I tended to be more violent, more, more temperamental, uh, more disruptive to the institution. You know, I just my time was considerably harder to do than what it is now. Okay. And um, how did you first find out about or come to find out about Buddhism? Mm. Well, I found out about Buddhism way before I came to the penitentiary. Um, uh, although when I started studying. Buddhism. I, I was here in the penitentiary. 
uh, I asked uh, the school ACI, the Asian Classics Institute, um, to put me in contact with some other people that were involved in Buddhism, and they referred me to Venerable Rabina Corton. They're behind you. <laughs> and uh, she's uh, helped answer a lot of my questions. Um, has improved my, my, my practice considerably, I think. Um, even though I'm still having problems. <laughs> uh, and it's just, it's just growing from there. Um, I continue my ACI classes, um, reading, studying, um, plus my, you know, my daily practice. And how do you find other prisoners kind of view your beliefs or combative? Can, can, any sort of example? Or, I mean, is it sort of um, an example? Uh, a lot of guys uh, like to play practical jokes. One of the things I like to joke about is a person's lifestyle, their religion, and uh, in this environment, that can lead to very disruptive behavior. It can lead to violence very quickly. Uh, prime example of that uh, young man out here in the yard here just recently was stabbed what four or five times all because of some horse play yeah this is not a you know I mean this is a maximum security penitentiary and that happens you know um, but it may it, when when people joke and cut up and stuff like that and I take this very seriously um, they, you, you lose your temper and it leads to bad things and it, it makes your time very hard to do. And it's, it's hard enough when you're in here because you, you know, we're controlled in everything that we do. We can't just run out to the store and pick up a can of milk or whatever. You know, everything we do in here is controlled by the penitentiary. You know, and there is no way, if you have a problem with somebody, you can go for a walk or you can remove yourself from that in, in, environment. We can't do that. I have approximately 16, 17, 18,000 square foot of whatever's inside this wall. The only way I can get away from these people would be either to go to PC or I deal with it. So it, it makes it very hard. And because Buddhism is not noted in this, it's not well known in this area or even in this part of the United States, um, there's a lot of jokes and a lot of um, practical jokes, uh, a lot of snide comments. It makes it very makes it very challenging to stay focused on what I'm doing. Are there any other Buddhists in the prison? Um, that are practicing? Well, maybe um, we have some guys over on death row, because you know we have a death row here. Uh, we have a few guys over on death row that I know that study. Um, I can't give you their names. Uh, and on the yard, in the group of the population that I'm in, no, I'm the only person. And relating to Rabina, do you, uh, when you first, can you describe your first meeting with Rabina, or are your expectations possibly? Or I'm glad I didn't have any expectations because she would have killed him dead. <laughs> I mean, she she wasn't anything like what I'm used to a nun being. You know, I'm used to dealing with Catholic nuns who are very solemn, very, very, um, what do they call it? Can't think. Uh, they're very conservative you know she's very flamboyant she's very she speaks very quickly um but it, it, it was a whole lot of fun it, it you know i was expecting it to be a very serious very solemn occasion and it was she made it fun and she made it interesting you know which again it make it, it she's a lot of fun to be with and when she's teaching um it's very easy to relate to what she's saying because she's not all solemn and trying to use a bunch of big words nobody understands you know she puts things so you can understand it and it you know, um, I was very impressed, and I'm still impressed. Okay, yeah. Um, that's, I mean, is, is there anything else, any, anything else um, you'd like to say about I mean, right now? Your Buddhist practice is that you think you're progressing all the time? Or, I mean, how do you feel it's like helping where you're with prison. Yeah. It's helping you deal with prison. Yeah, yeah, it's helping me immensely deal with prison. It's helping me to stay focused on things that are important. It's it's um, helping me stay away from things that are or could lead to potentially hazardous situations such as um, gambling or um, something very prevalent on the yard, homosexual activity, uh, getting involved with the gangs, which we have numerous of out on the yard, um, 
it's helping me to stay away from that. It's helping me to stay keeping my attention focused on something that not only is helping me now, but it's also something that will help me if I ever get out of the penitentiary. You know, so yeah, I would say, I would say it's making my time considerably easier. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, I have a formal training background in, in a number of different styles in martial arts. Um, how I caught my murder charge was I actually beat a man to death in the span of about six seconds. Um, it's a very scary thing when you think about it. You know, I mean, it's it's one thing to sit there and think, oh, I'm going to kill this person and walk away and forget about it. But when you actually carry through with that thought and you do it with your own hands or your feet, it changes your whole perspective on things because you realize how fragile human life really is. Um, and in here, because of the way I was brought up in things, my attitude is, is not conducive. Because if somebody put your hands on you, I was brought up to believe that that person is out to hurt you. The best bet to, to eliminate is you eliminate the problem, literally. And through my studying of Buddhism, it's keeping me more... I'm not going to say relaxed because I'm having a lot of frustration right now. Because so saying I'm relaxed would be a lie, but it's it's keeping me focused away from and it's keeping me away from the people that could possibly put me in a position to where I would react like that. Because it's it's still even with my practice in Buddhism, which I this is a bad thing to say I think, but I still feel that the potential is there for me to to, to do serious bodily harm to somebody, and it's you know or to go uh, again kill somebody. You know, so Buddhism is helping me stay away from that. It's it's keeping me, like I said, focused on Buddhism, and it's I'm using that, and there's nothing left. You know, there's no other time left really to I don't have to worry about being out here on the yard because I spend most of my time in my cell studying. You know, and it's it's just and it's helping me keep my temper in check. You know, which is important. Um, let's see how much I do. Let's see. Um, I follow Loma Zopa's. Am I pronouncing that right? Lama Zopa? Zopa? Yeah, no. Zopa. Um, daily meditation oh, practice. Uh, okay. Um, my daily practice, I usually get up about 4 o'clock in the morning and I do my preliminary prostrations and then I do the whole prostration practice. Um, let me think of the name of it here. Um, I can't think of the name of it. No, there's another name for it. The Confession of the Heaps. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, do, I, I go through the Confession of the Heaps. The three heaps. Oh, I forgot the three. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I do about 400 of them a day, but I do 200 and a few to in the morning, um, which is part of a larger practice that I do, which is um, Lama Zopa's uh, a daily meditation practice, which in itself, I think, if I'm understanding it correctly, it's just like a larger purification and... Um, offering practice. Um, then I go to work. I work from 7.15 in the morning till approximately 1.45 uh, in our garment black back here making these wonderful stay clothes. Uh, and then I come back in. We eat dinner about 3.45 or so. Um, and I'll spend any free time that I have I usually spend reading one of the Buddhist books that Ms. Rabina has sent to me. Um, or studying my ACI classes. And then in the evenings, after everything is settled down in the evening, usually about 10 o'clock, I go through the complete prostration practice again and go to bed. And that's usually about 11 or 11.15. And then I get back up at 4 o'clock the next morning and start all over again. And so were you um, of a different like, faith earlier in life? Or you, you I was raised Roman Catholic. And how do you think... Buddhism different differs from what do you think a few fundamental kind of differences are? I think Buddhism deals with reality. Roman Catholicism deals with um, man's inability to recognize that he himself is the highest, that his mind is the highest stage that there is. Where Catholicism teaches you that you're just this little peon down here, and in order to accomplish anything, you got to go to the big guys over here. And I don't, I don't agree with that doctrine at all. I, we're, to me, Buddhism. It makes sense, you know, because you're dealing with where the problems are at. You're not dealing with the, 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 the superficial stuff at the, at the beginning. You're dealing with the stuff that's actually the cause of the problems, which is your mind, you know, which I think is 
important, you know, because if you don't cure what's causing the problem, then you may cure the problem temporarily, but then the next thing you know, it's going to come back and it's going to slap you in the face. It's like, I'm back, you know. <laughs> it's, you know, so that's a fundamental difference. Um, what other differences are there? Um, I mean, it's just it's an it's an entirely different doctrine, you know, and it's Buddhism can it, is based on logic. Um, nowhere, if you if you if you've ever read the Bible, which is a, it's a wonderful book, and it teaches a lot of wonderful lessons, but there's there's no logical proof behind it. You know, um, where Buddhism, I mean, you can logically sit down and and think about it and look at it, and you 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 can either prove it or disprove it with logic. You know, the Bible you can't do that. It's you have to take a giant leap of faith, and yes, this exists out there somewhere. Um, and it's beyond me, and I can't understand it, so I'm not even going to get, you know, and that just, to me, that doesn't make any sense, you know. Um, yeah, that's about the, the biggest fundamental differences, I think. <laughs> Excuse me. Great. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Mm-hmm. If we could just quickly just um, grab a couple of shots with you and Rabina, kind of talking or something, or <laughs> talking or something. <laughs> <laughs> Holding hands, laughing. <laughs> yeah, we do that a lot. Yes. <laughs> You're getting your robes up. I know. Phenomenal. We can clean it later. Hey, don't worry. Direction. So then tell me, keep going about your, talking oh. about your, um, what were you talking well, there about? Was a, what we were talking about in practice. You there was a, going back, um, it's a memorization thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Like I said, I think that's not only me, but, a, and you can tell me your opinion of this. Oh. I mean, is that, could that be like, what's the term for that, back check state? I could have accumulated the before. Inference. Sure, the sure, inference sure. Oh, yeah. would would cause that. You mean cause you to not be able to memorize? Yeah, to, yeah, to have just, a problem with the understanding. Yeah, memory, yeah and sure, the, absolutely. That's exactly how they talk. Okay. That are the sort of the obstacle. The extent to which you can be clear about something is the extent to which there isn't an obstacle, and the extent to which you can't be is the extent to which the ignorance is just strong. I mean, ignorance is the delusions are just the obstacle. That's all. That's delusion. You know? mm-hmm. It's an old habit with certain delusions causes you when you hear something just not to comprehend it. So that's what part of that's what purification is, but keep and just keeping doing it. Okay, so so, so to continue doing because yeah. you told me not to stop yeah. when I finish my two hundred thousand, right. yeah. which I'm just about done with. You are really? Yeah. Already? Yeah. Honestly, no, you, if you <laughs> added up four hundred a day and I started many, doing them September first. Oh, so <laughs> well, you got to keep doing it. You don't have to do yeah, that. Yeah, that, well, that's what you said. But you, that's what you said, yeah, and that, um, and that will eliminate. It, Slowly but surely, keep eliminating them. Definitely. There's no question. I do every okay. morning and night of my life. Oh, you still it's do practice. practice? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. Everybody does. All and all. It's the most pe- precious practice. I mean, I only do 100. I don't do as many as you, 120. I every think morning. you're a little bit older than <laughs> you, can, you might not be. T- <laughs> you know, because, I mean, I do push-ups and sit-ups every day, too. But you also do? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I have oh, okay. to. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> Getting fat is out of the question. <laughs> <laughs> You, you can't practice if you're sick. If when your true. body gets out of shape, you get yeah, sick. That's true. Um, there was a question. There was something else I needed to ask okay, you about. Okay, come on. It had to do with my classes. Mm-hmm. Now I can't remember what it was. So you got me to giggling. Never mind. What are you studying <laughs> at the moment? Tell me what you're studying at the moment. What's right now I'm working on the book, um, oh. Understanding the Mind. Yeah, great. Which okay. I think is important because that kind of goes, that goes along with, um, mm. well, to an extent, understanding mm. past and future lives. Absolutely. I don't know Absolutely. if you've done that class yet. Absolutely. Well, you not, probably I have, have but you, <laughs> you probably studied. Yeah. I still don't understand it. That's I true. don't understand uh, Master Dharma Kruti's nine reasonings for that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, he starts with the same three reasons every time, and what it just. What is that? So tell me. Um, a baby's born. Yes. This is the first reason. It's <laughs> life is a continuous. It breathes. Uh huh. And and this is a law of science. Yes, which, now this makes sense sure. because in order for something to continue, it has to be made. From the same type of material. That's exactly right. That's a good point. That's an yeah. excellent point to get. So you're, I guess he, he's explaining it, but his reasons are all the same every time. I know. He sure. just restates but it. But the problem with this is, the thing is with us Westerners, we have to first establish that consciousness is not physical. Because we can all accept that something that comes from something has to come in the same, has to have to be right. in the same nature. That's what the elements are for. So the, one of the fundamental ones is to try and establish how consciousness isn't your brain, which is the biggest one. Right. Well, because your brain is just a physical lump of matter. Yeah, but people don't, people say, well, you know, they have all the many reasons in the West, all these highly intelligent people pointing out how that's your mind. So it's not an easy one to accept that 
anger is a non-physical phenomenon. It's like jealousy is a non-physical thing. You can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it. I mean, right. the more you, you can't physically it, do no, any. You can't physically no, manipulate that's it. That's right. Well, that's what that's what they're discovering. But they have to right. still come to the conclusion there has to be something else. That's all. So that's what you've got to think about. Why do you think about that? Then it's not so surprising that consciousness can. Mm, that's something else I'm doing in the life. evenings before What's I go that? to bed. I'm sitting down, looking at all the little things that I had through the day. Oh, like if I got good. mad at that's something, um. That's, that's part of your purification practice, actually. Do you do when you do your, your evening practice? Do you do it in the context of the four opponent powers? Mm -hmm. That's very important. Yeah, you told me to keep those in mind whenever I did it. Oh, you okay. didn't say in the evening or the morning. You just said do it this way. That's <laughs> okay. How did you figure that out? If you tell me to do something, it gets done exactly that way. Does it? <laughs> yeah, it's. Ralph. I do. I'm serious. I don't change it. <laughs> it don't make a difference if I understand it or not. Being said, do it this way. That's the end of it. Okay. <laughs> You've been at this 23 years. It's. I'm not going to question you on it, you know. It's a, plus it says in the, um, oh, yeah, not Uttara Tantra. What? The, it's a llama practice. Dedication, okay. no, not dedication mm -hmm. to a llama. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? Guru Yoga. Guru Yoga, yeah. Yeah, sure. it says in there that you shouldn't question a person that teaches you something about Buddhism. Well, <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. See, it says, do, do not okay. question. And it does. It states that very... Okay. Yeah, That's I found cool. that in one of them little pamphlets okay. from the, the guy that's stuck on this. This is the, is not the sign that the law is showing us. See, when you see him, then you, you acknowledge a law is through you. You like you say, you the law. You say, look at the law. Oh, praise you. This is what the property of law is. And I already told him. This is what the property of law you can't be in the way. Something else. He says, you can't believe that I get angry. <laughs> says, You're always happy and smiling and laughing. He says, you can't believe that I can also be angry. I suppose. <laughs> so you're not going to say anything bad. He's biased. He has a biased opinion. Well, he's very happy. He doesn't get angry. This boy. Very quiet. Very, very good, 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 good. Uh, they're good teachers for me. Both of them, they speak so good quietly teachers. and hardly hear. As long as you remember, an education is the most important thing in life. Yeah, it? Most guys your age don't know that, but it's true. <laughs> okay, now what were you? Yeah, I was just yeah, wondering how, you, um, from after studying Buddhism, how you, you just mentioned before, how you realized. I said he'd murdered somebody, you said it sounds awful. You mean that one? Mm. Yeah. So that yeah. one. When, okay, you. And don't take this personally because it's not meant to be degrading or anything like that. As a young man, you think you're basically indestructible. Okay? Um, I don't know what type of lifestyle you leave it or whatever. But if you're the average teenager, you go out there and you have a beer every now and then or whatever. Um, you don't give a second thought to dying. It's not something that's prevalent in your mind every day. You don't think about it. You're like, I'm going to live forever. Whether it's consciously or consciously. When you go out and you take another human being's life and you do it in the way that I did it, where it's very personal and you see the immediate results of your actions, you realize how fragile human life really is. It takes really no effort to, to, to take a life or to lose your life. Something as very simple as you tripping and falling in the bathroom could end your life. You know, as you stepped out of the shower, your feet are wet, you hit the wet floor. You know, and after you've killed somebody, or at least in my case, and most of the guys I've spoke with on death row are the, of the same opinion, it becomes very prevalent in your mind, very, it comes to the front of your mind just how fragile human life really is. And you, you gain on, unless you're a really sick individual, <laughs> which we have a few of those in here. But again, in my, in my case, I'm, I'm only speaking for me, I have become very, very aware of human life and other life for that matter um, and it's I have more respect for it now than what I did um, before studying Buddhism or before actually killing somebody um, you know and it's like I said I mean it's something it brings it very I mean it like brings it home I mean it becomes something that you think about every day you know I mean there's not a day goes by that I don't sit here and I think about the approximately I'm going to give it a long period of time called 30 seconds that, that, it, that the incident that took place with me happened that I don't relive that incident and look at the fact that 
it took boy, literally no effort at all on my part, you know, and it's scary, you know, and it's like you realize that I'm the same as he is. I'm flesh and blood and bones and a brain and all that just like he is, and I could die just as quickly, you know, and it, that's something that stays in your mind, you know, and it's something that I hope stays in my mind till I die, whenever that will be because I feel it's a very important thing to, to, to realize. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if, I mean, if it would be right to go into like the or why or the situation or the, what brought you The man disrespected me. It's as simple as that. He, um, how do I put this um, politically correctly? He wanted something that I wasn't willing to give him and he decided he was going to take it by force. And the type of individual he was, uh, he was a 42-year-old man, ex-Navy SEAL type guy, supposed to be one of them hardcore killer types, uh, thought that because I was a young kid at the time I was, uh, well, I had just had my 23rd birthday, um, he thought, well, I can just overpower this individual. I can take what I want to see end of it. And I exerted myself to an extent and prove to him beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm not... I'm not a, you know, an easy target, you know. I'm a person I'm going to fight back. And when I fight back it's for keeps. You know, there are the only stake you fight for is life. You know, and that's that was my mental state at that time. Bad mental state, but that's basically he disrespected me and I retaliated to the situation. You know. Um, so it had to do with drugs, it had to do with no, drugs. It nothing to do with drugs. I thought you said it was a drug dealer, mm -hmm. he was a drug He dealer. was a drug dealer. And he was dealing to children, I think. Yeah, well he's what? dealing to children. Uh, to me that's disrespecting me. You know, I didn't know if you wanted to go into all that or... But no, it's interesting. Though. Yeah, that's... I have no respect for drug dealers. I have no respect for people that drink. Um, because to me, even before I got locked up, it's a waste of life. You know, you, you are wasting the most... And this sounds wrong, it really does. But the most powerful weapon you have is your mind. It's unstoppable if it's used correctly. If you pollute it with drugs or alcohol or in my case, wrong views. <laughs> uh, you, you're, you're, you're not only hurting yourself, you're hurting the people that are going to follow after you, your children, their children. You know, Again, that's something that you think when you kill somebody, that's something that, again, I put that man into a position. His family died with him. You know, 20 or 30 years from now, nobody will ever remember who that man was. He has no family. He has, you know, well, he didn't have any friends. <laughs> he was a drug dealer, so, he, you know, outside of his money, he didn't have any friends, you know. But I ended that, any possibility of that man being able to change his lifestyle, you know. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bad thing, but, you know. Um, any other questions? He can go home and think about this. I hope. <laughs> well, I've been learning a lot since I came yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, th if you think about it and you're real honest with yourself, and you're, you're, you behind the camera. I can't remember your name. Vinny. 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 You keep me from an Australian have an Italian name. Vincent is, well, his mum's from Polynesia. She's Samoan, and his dad's German, so there you go. And he's brought up, brought up in Australia, so his name's Vincent Hyman. <laughs> That's, there you go, you see. I thought I had a confusing background. What yeah. are you? What's your? Huh? Let's see. My grandmother was German. My grandfather was Russian. On the other side, I've got a Polak, and, a <laughs> and I don't know what my other grandma was. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you're not hear me on the phone. Said the That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ask Nick. He's Russian. Okay. Yeah. Ask oh, him. Okay. Yeah. It's like hello, how are you? Yeah. But yeah, it's that's real confusing. <laughs> But now I lost my train of thought. And you were talking about something you went to him. You say you behind the camera. Yeah, no, yeah, you're approximately the same age as he is, right? Nineteen. That's what he said. Um, if you if you think about it and you're real honest with yourself, you you never you never give a thought at all to I could go out and get in my car and get wasted, you know, all over. You know, somebody could run me over, or well, I could. I mean, do you ever think about that? Do you? You know, I mean, you ever think when you're getting out of the shower, I may slip and fall right now and break my neck? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's a very common way in this country for people to die. Thousands of people a year die that way. 
They step out of their shower, they slip, and they fall and break their neck. <laughs> it's a stupid way to die, but it happens, you know. More people are killed crossing the street, you know, than people are murdered in the United States, you know, and there's a whole lot of murder. You know, like we had like, what, 1,500 of them murdered in one year in New Orleans alone. Oh, really? Yeah. It was a murder capital of the world. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Town of a million people had over a thousand people killed in a year. Oh. <laughs> Violent town. Well, where are you from? But, You're from Detroit, aren't you? Yeah, I'm from Detroit. They come in second. Detroit comes in second. <laughs> yeah, they come in second. They used to be the murder capital of the world. But you never, you never give a thought to that, you know, and it's something that you should think about because you, you know, and I'm going to go to a Buddhist teaching here. Yeah, he's a Buddhist teaching. Yeah, he's yeah, a Buddhist teaching now. They've been hearing um, you about it all weekend. Yeah. We get cool weekend courses now. That's good. It's, it's important, I think. You know, but that's my opinion. Um, how, does, how does that go? There's, there's three things that you should always remember. You, you don't know when you're going to die. Mm -hmm. You okay. can't take anything with you. And what's the third one? Well, the first one is that death is definite. Well, yeah, there it is. Death, the second death one is, is the time of death is uncertain. Uncertain. Well, you the don't know what's going to happen. The, what, what is important at the time of death is only your mind. Yeah. Only I knew it was in there. No, because uh, there's another one because I tell you, you can't take nothing in well, this. Unless there's probably three sections of one of the three sections. Oh. They can't. Never mind. <laughs> it gets confused. But it is. You, you don't know when it's going to happen. Nobody does, you know, unless you... Like clairvoyant. A clairvoyant. And I, I, don't, I don't know anybody personally. I'm not going to say there aren't clairvoyant people, but I don't know any personally that are clairvoyant, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so you don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, it could happen right now. You could just fall over dead with a heart attack. How many people a year die of a heart attack, you know? So it's something you should think about. You know, you should be aware of it. And in my opinion, you should make the correct preparations to deal with it. And in my opinion, a correct preparation for that would be studying Buddhism. You know, for other people, it may be Christianity or whatever. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, you know, that's just my opinion, like I said, you know. What else? That's good, Ralph, whatever. They're happy to hear you talk. Oh. I think I'm covering my studies correctly. I think you did pretty well. <laughs> oh. Hey, what are you going to talk about tomorrow? I don't know. Let's see what happens. Oh, about four or five people have asked me, what is she going to speak on? And I was like... Just say, karma, reincarnation. How, okay. to, how to practice Buddhism in daily life. Whatever you like. Yeah, that would be good. Sorry. How to practice it in daily life. How to practice Buddhism. How to, how, yeah, how to keep your mind happy in difficult situations. I'm Tim O'Dell, and I'm the chaplain chief here at the penitentiary. And, uh, yeah, so do you, uh, how do you deal with um, prisoners? Do you deal with them directly or is it, um, Generally speaking, I deal with inmates one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and uh, what's the prison's view of other uh, prisoners with other faiths? Well, from an official standpoint, we, we obviously recognize an individual's right to practice his faith. And in the United States, at least, it is a constitutional right. That's only restricted here um, if there is a valid security concern. That is, if the practice of his faith required him to kill someone, or, or you know, if he were a vampire or something, then obviously we would restrict that kind of behavior. But as a general rule, uh, virtually every religion uh, can be practiced, again, so long as it doesn't threaten the security and order of the institution. And we try to facilitate that as much as possible. Uh, we have a number of faiths represented here uh, obviously, we have uh, Catholicism and Protestant Christianity. We have uh, a couple of practicing Jews. Uh, we have uh, uh, one fellow who's probably serious about his Buddhist faith and some others who are interested in Buddhism but really haven't decided. Um, we have a number who practice uh, some of the more obscure religions. Uh, Odinism, for example, which is uh, a revival of the Norse god religions out of the Viking era. Um, we have the Moorish Science Temple, which is a, uh, a kind of a nationalist spin-off from Islam. And then we have various expressions of Islam, both Sunni and Shiite, as well as the nation of Islam here. Uh, we have a number of agnostics. We have a number who would call themselves atheists. Uh, but we try to meet the needs of men where they are on, on a given situation. We deal with death messages as well as spiritual issues. and. Uh, try to facilitate their practice of faith and then try to help them deal with the crisis that they deal with in life. Okay, and how do you find uh, the prisoners with different faiths? How do you find they interact? Or, like, how do they, do they you know, in terms of... 
Well, for the most part, they, they pretty well tolerate one another. Now, some of the faith groups are decidedly biased on particular racial issues or one thing or another, and they tend to be a little bit distant uh, as a result of both their philosophies as well as their religion, um, but not to the point of creating a problem. Um, for the most part, everybody pretty well recognizes the other's right to practice his particular religion. Now, we have some pretty strong advocates of various religious groups, and sometimes those, uh, uh, if you will, degenerate into some pretty heated theological discussions, if you will. And I use the term theological, probably a better term would be philosophical discussions. Uh, but very rarely does that require intervention. They'll finally get frustrated with one another and go their separate ways. And uh, so it gets well, pretty well here. We don't have a lot of problems. Could you sort of describe a, a typical session or a typical day, like how you run through your... A typical day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have, we in the course of a month, we'll have probably 80 different programs here in the chapel. Uh, so there's not really a typical day. Uh, the, the structure of that day is driven by what programs are scheduled for that particular day, as well as any death messages we receive or serious illnesses me messages or... Um, uh, an inmate gets a crisis because he gets a, a Dear John letter from his wife who says, I'm leaving you, I'm divorced, and divorcing you, and that sort of thing. Uh, we have to deal with those on a, if you will, as needed kind of basis. So no two days are exactly the same. Um, from a general perspective, I try to maintain the programs, try to keep them in place, try to keep the outside guests that are involved, and I've got roughly 280, 290 people right now who are regular volunteers in the chapel program from various faith groups. Um, they're pretty active here. Try to keep all that together and juggle, keep our schedule on track. Um, and then try to deal with inmates one-on-one -on -one as, as the need presents itself. And that varies a lot. And uh, when, do you know when that uh, constitutional uh, right was brought in, in prisons to was that a, is that a recent thing? Or oh, no, no. The, the, the right to the free exercise of religion is, is a part of the Bill of Rights, and it's, it's a part of the Constitution as old as the United States. Uh, this, this country was founded uh, by men and women who were seeking freedom of religious expression rather than religion being opposed by state order. Uh, and as a result of that, there's been a very strong defense of religious freedom since the very earliest uh, beginnings of the United States. The penal system, for the most part, has recognized that philosophy all along. Now, there have been some exceptions to that. If you, if you look at uh, the history of penology in the United States, you'll find that there were, during the Quaker era, for example, and um, the name penitentiary came from the concept of creating a penitence uh, attitude, uh, a, a repentant attitude in the parts of men. And so penance, uh, the act of, of changing one's life and being sorrowful for, for uh, past behaviors was a part of, and in some cases, chapel services were mandatory in some prisons. Um, that those are kind of spattered through history. In, if you research con, uh, the history of prisons, you'll find those, those events occurring in some prisons at some times, but it's certainly never been a uniform thing. The country at large has still advocated the freedom of religion. Okay, and with um, prisoners on death row specifically, um, I'm not sure exactly the, the process, but do they, um, at, at you know, the time of execution, they request, um, it was usually a, a priest, is that, do they request? They may, they may request a clergyman of their choosing uh, during the last hours preceding uh, their execution and then uh, to do last rites in the case of uh, Catholicism, obviously a priest would be permitted to, to do last rites. In the case of Protestant faiths, uh, there would be an opportunity given for him to have a private council uh, with his pastor. Uh, with other expressions of faith, again, only subject to security concerns, uh, an inmate would be given the right to select someone with whom he could spend uh, a period of time immediately prior to his execution to deal with spiritual matters. Um, we have only, in Kentucky, we've only recently gotten back into the uh, execution mode. Um, the court issues were finally resolved after a 35-year lapse. Uh, during that time frame, the man that was condemned and was ultimately executed um, sought solstice and uh, 
confession from a particular spiritual advisor who was permitted uh, a great deal of access to him in the last 10 days prior to his execution and up until just moments before his execution. Okay. Terrific. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Too old fantasizing. <laughs> Chaplain has helped me in many ways because before I run into, say, Chaplain old Dale Harry, uh, I was a very lost man. Uh, I didn't know where my life was going and what determination I had in directing my life. But now that I've talked to Chaplain old Dale and come down here to the services and listen to his words and the preaching of God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, I have determined the path of my life. You know, uh, it's opened many a doors. He has opened many a doors for me and other brothers, brother Christians, to find and have a stronger hope within us and being able to find an easier path to the Lord Jesus Christ through him, through the chapel, and through other brothers that is more fluent and more understanding.